Well, when we first moved here, I discovered just how horrible the cost of oil was. As a forester, I felt it was a good opportunity to look around at systems. We compared a variety of systems, ground source heat pumps, solar pumps, etc., etc., and not surprisingly, I settled on wood. The reason we chose a, a, a log boiler system for ours rather than chip, in my instance, I can just go and collect a trailer load of wood provided it's dry enough and I've thought long enough ahead to get the right moisture content in my timber, process it and bring it up to the house. Indeed, in the process of some of the house renovations, some of the wood that's been left over has gone through the boiler. Theory on the numbers we've worked out for a house this size and a 45 kilowatt boiler, which is what we've got, we need about 25 tonnes to 30 tonnes a year. Now, that equates to about an articulated lorry load, if you think about it in that form. A lot of people would say, oh, well, that's a lot of wood. It isn't really once you start splitting it up and using it. Uh, we use considerably more in the winter than the summer for obvious reasons. But because I have a separate area outside without the house, um, we can store that amount quite easily. And provided I cut it and split it, well, probably six months ahead of time, I know it'll be dry enough. Obviously, we keep it covered, we keep it up as much as possible, keep the rain off. Um, and uh, one of the first things you buy when you own, own one of these is a moisture meter, and you can double check. Um, the boilers are relatively forgiving, but they don't like soggy wood, that's for sure. In an ideal world, I like sort of 20% uh, moisture content. I'm afraid some at 30 has sneaked in. Obviously, there's a few logs that come off the bottom of the pile or might have been outside accidentally when the sheet's not been pulled over them. They go in a bit wetter at 30. Um, it, the boiler can cope with it. This particular boiler has a sensor on it that will adjust for those values um, to allow for different moisture and contents. Above those moisture contents, it's very difficult to light the wood anyway. So you really don't want to be doing that and you get a lot of muck coming down the flue, uh, which is pointless, it's corrosive and it's not, not nice to deal with. So if you can get it to 20, 25%, that's ideal. In terms of types and species of wood, this boiler is incredibly for forgiving. It really doesn't mind whether it's hardwood or softwood. Um, we've had instances where we've done a softwood thinning and there's been a certain amount of dead wood which I can't sell into the normal markets and I just take it home, tidy the wood up, it goes through the boiler. The one thing you can't put through it is any sort of treated wood. You, you really shouldn't put uh, MDF or chipboard or any of those sort of man-made fibre boards in. Not really because it won't burn, but it's the gases that are given off are highly corrosive and you will actually damage the boiler and, and the flue if you keep using those sort of things. And it's not very good for the environment either. Usually I would come in in the evening and uh, I'd have a quick look at the computer screen here. This tells me the temperature going on in the tank, tells me the temperature the boiler's at, and it's got this clever little icon here that looks just like the battery meter on your phone. When it's at four blips, no problem. When it's at one, as it is now, I'm thinking I need to, need to light the boiler. So away we go. I just open the door. You'll hear the fan start up. At that point, I'll switch the fan off because I don't want all the heat that's left going straight up the flue. We open this door and this one. The reason for the fan starting when I open the door is if there's any fire or light or smoke in here, it's sucked into this vent ensuring that you don't get any fumes coming out into the house or smoke or soot, etc. So this is really where it's all happening. The gases and flames are shooting down from the wood through a slot into this chamber. They swirling around, coming out here, back down through this. So superheating all this mass of fire brick and the steel around it. The gases then go up the heat exchanger pipes at the back and out through the flue. This ash here Basically, it's about three weeks worth collected so far. Um, come the end of the month, which is the time I've set myself, I will sweep that out and away onto the roses. So every time we come to light the boiler, one of the little duties you have to learn is to give it a clean. And you just give that a waggle. About eight times is fine, and that's cleaned all the heat exchanger pipes, and we're ready to go on the lighting. That goes in, and then we top it up with logs. So then the next phase is the lighting. Here I cheat slightly, switch the fan on, 
like that. Ignite the cardboard. You learn quite quickly which cardboard burns best, actually. Once my cardboard's going nicely, I do nothing more but watch this. Uh, and we're climb climbing quite rapidly. This is the old oil boiler that we've kept so that if there's a sudden drop in temperature or we go away on holiday, there is a backup to provide a bit of heat. The wood boiler controls that oil. This is the very large expansion tank that we need to act for this accumulator tank. Obviously because of rising pressures or reducing pressures with the heating and cooling of the water, you need a large oversized expansion tank. In the case of this particular domestic hot water tank, we've got a twin coil one put in. It does any heat source plus solar. But my plumber was quite ingenious in the you loop the whole system through. So all the heat goes through twice. This means we get twice as fast recovery on heat. And I've watched this rise 20 degrees in 20 minutes, which is pretty amazing for a system like this. Small accumulator tank absolutely standard in virtually every house that has a high pressure water system. This is a very clever distribution manifold. With the aid of the computer in the boiler, we have a circuit for downstairs heating, a circuit for upstairs heating, and a hot water circuit. Everyone's got a hot water circuit, so don't be frightened by that section. Everyone's got a hot water circuit for their radiators. It's just we have two, one for upstairs, one for downstairs. The computer is controlling through these valves how much heat it needs to let in to get the house to the temperature we want. No more, no less. The first six months that we owned this system with our house, we kept thinking, shouldn't we be turning the heating up or down or moving or doing something? But it does it so seamlessly, there's no need. One of the keys to efficiency with this particular wood boiler system is you need to have an accumulator tank. This is actually your heat battery. That chucks out an awful lot of heat over a period of about four hours, some of which is contained with its own bodywork, but it puts that heat into this two and a half thousand litres of boiling hot water here, well, 90 degrees centigrade. That then stores your heat, which is slowly distributed around as it's required. In terms of the costs of the system, it's a bit like buying a car. You can buy a Mini or you can buy a Rolls Royce and prices are very much reflected in this. We could have spent half, exactly half, what we've spent on our boiler, our accumulator tank, and the distribution system. However, I figured with a lifespan of 20, 25 years, I'm gonna be over 70, and I wanted the system that's gonna be as easy for me to use then as it is now. So we went for the slightly more expensive one in terms of the cleaning is very simple, the servicing is very simple. Um, it's highly efficient. By spending a bit more, you gain quite a bit in efficiency and cleanliness. Having been through the figures, we realized it was gonna cost us around double to install this system over a conventional system with the plumbing. Um, on the other hand, the potential savings in fuel costs were massive. Uh, on top of this, th there's the benefit of the renewable heat incentive, which is in the domestic situation, hopefully coming in soon. Um, and this will definitely lead to positive payback over the next, originally 20 years, they're talking about seven years now, but it will be a positive payback um, in return for our uh, investment in green energy. In, in this particular installation, the, the system is heating the large accumulator tank behind us. That's where all the heat goes. That in turn is then distributed and chosen by the machine as to whether it goes to the upstairs heating, downstairs heating, or the hot, domestic hot water circuit. Um, it works all those figures out and decides which bit needs which amount of heat and thereby is most efficient in use of its heat. It was a two-day installation which basically on the first day was a case of putting together certain parts, positioning them uh, and the plumber doing his connections. Uh, the electrician came the next day along with a boiler engineer who did the final 
connections and then tested the system to prove that it was up and functioning. Because we followed the rules in terms of a, a, a bioenergy system, in other words, we used the correct installer, we used the correct type of boiler, there are some on lists that can be used. A lot of manufacturers didn't bother to get themselves licensed. If you use these people, then you become eligible for the renewable heat incentive. RHI, Renewable Heat Incentive, is a brand new scheme introduced by the coalition government to support people that want to use renewable heat systems in their homes. There are an increasing number of exciting technologies that people can deploy effectively as an alternative to oil and gas, and particularly people living in rural areas where they're off the gas grid, uh, they are really uh, know how expensive uh, heating oil can be. The government has a tariff scheme which will involve four quarterly payments for seven years to help people cover the cost of installing these new measures. That could be air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps and also um, biomass boilers, boilers that support uh, heating and hot water that also um, are, gen are generating their heat from uh, wood or wood pellets. Wood boilers in general are much more efficient than gas or oil boilers. They're producing far less emissions. Um, this one, for instance, burns at about 96 to 98 percent efficiency. You cannot get an oil or gas boiler that will burn at that. Um, the production residues on this are a tiny amount of ash that I clean out once a month, which is great for the roses. Um, so I feel it's a clean, sustainable source of fuel. We've got to reduce our carbon emissions as a country and heat actually is often forgotten. The amount that we produce uh, of carbon emissions from heating systems is very large indeed and we need to do far more to reduce that. People often focus on electricity, um, the feed-in tariff for things like solar panels has been very popular but heat is just as big a problem. So we're taking this next step to encourage people by giving them tariff payments. The major benefit for me with this system is I'm actually growing my own fuel. Um, because of the nature of our work as forestry contractors, obviously we do have access to a lot of wood from outside. In the wider domestic market with this sort of boiler, I perceive there'll be a lot of people who would be interested in the fact that they can grow or can source the wood locally, I should say, in that there are an awful lot of undermanaged woodlands in the southeast of England particularly. There's plenty of undermanaged woodlands in most of England, actually, um, which are desperate for a market. This sort of market would help people like myself as a forestry contractor, and I feel the householder would have access to a more economical fuel source, potentially, um, and he could enter long-term agreements with a supplier who would ensure the quality. So it makes sense for people living in rural areas like East Sussex um, to take advantage of this. Now East Sussex is historically one of the most wooded areas in England. It's got a beautiful landscape but all of this woodland this and these coppices actually benefit from being actively managed. People have got very familiar with farmers markets, buying local, um, thinking about seasonal local produce, thinking about food miles. We want to encourage people to think about local energy markets buying local energy, particularly if it's uh, coppiced, from local suppliers, even better um, if you've got access to uh, timber yourself that you can, you can use and, and uh, fell sustainably in coppice. East Sussex was built on coppicing. We could see a wonderful renaissance here in the 21st century.